A month ago, I moved to Japan where I'm going to be staying for up to a year and one of the first things I wanted to do was to get a gym membership, so literally a day after I arrived, I walked 5 kilometers to visit a gym that I could potentially start going to. Now, I had heard that Japanese gyms are really expensive and pretty badly equipped, but this one cost around 35 euros a month, which seemingly wasn't too bad at all considering that the price also included access to a pool, a sauna and so on. So once I finally arrived, I wanted to buy a one day pass to check it out, but turned out that the only option they had was to register for a 3 day trial that you can only get once. So after filling out multiple forms and surveys, as well as writing my address in kanji like 3 times, I also had to watch 2 videos that were around 5 minutes long that showed the various places where you're not allowed to wear shoes, such as the locker room and lobby, and working out in socks was also not allowed, so I also had to rent indoor shoes directly from the gym. But where things started to get a a bit weird was when I found out that I also had to go through a mandatory gym introduction by a personal trainer that began with measuring my body composition on an in-body scale, which spat out a bunch of measurements that were then explained to me, for example that I apparently have more muscle mass on one side of the body rather than the other, which must have been all of those mixed with deadlifts. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it was definitely fun and interesting to see what those measurements were going to be, but if you're somewhat knowledgeable about measuring body compositions, you know that those scales can be so incredibly inaccurate that it's better to take those results with a huge grain of salt, which is also why it was a bit surprising to me to see them play such a big role in the introduction, but I guess it helps give beginners an arbitrary fitness goal to aim towards so they keep paying for membership. Anyway, since I was able to mention that I already had a lot of gym experience, I luckily didn't have to go through the equipment introductions, however the coach did go over the rules of the gym and some of them were quite surprising. So first of all, you aren't allowed to have phone calls in the gym nor in the locker room, where you're also not allowed to text either, which both are apparently very common rules in Japanese gyms. Another incredibly common rule is that you're not allowed to have visible tattoos. If you have them, you need to cover them up, but apparently in some gyms, revealing the fact that you have tattoos in the first place might get you barred from receiving membership even as a foreigner. Then there were a bunch of other rules such as don't drop your weights, no grunting, no hyping up your friends, no shirtless posing and so on, but also you are not allowed to take pictures or videos in the gym even of yourself. Now this is a genuine problem because filming yourself is pretty important for checking your form, especially as a beginner, but it can be very valuable even for advanced lifters when trying out new exercises or for comparing form, tempo and effort from week to week to make sure that the progressive overload stays as consistent as possible. Another rule, which is also apparently very common, is that you only have 20 minutes to use a specific piece of equipment. There was a timer attached to benches, power racks, machines and so on, and you have to set it to 20 minutes. Once it runs out, you have to stop and move on. Now, even though you can come back later and use the same equipment again, this rule makes supersetting, aka doing multiple sets of different exercises in a row to save time, pretty much impossible. Supersets become a crucial time-saving tool when you have around 8 exercises each day, or even more than 10 if you can only go to the gym around 2 to 3 times per week instead of 5 or 6. Not just that, but anyone who has ever done 4 to 5 sets of heavy compounds such as squats or deadlifts knows that 20 minutes is not going to cut it. You genuinely might not even be done with warm-ups before 20 minutes has already passed. Speaking of deadlifts, since there was a rule against dropping weights and making noise, they were obviously out of the question and if you're strong, there probably wouldn't have been enough plates for you anyway and there also were some other pieces of equipment missing as well, such as a preacher curl, cable row, etc. and overall it definitely felt more like a social health club rather than a gym that endorsed more serious lifting, so I started looking elsewhere. I was checking out all the nearby gyms online and I found one that seemed really good considering that they they had a deadlift platform with bumper blades, a climbing wall and even an arm wrestling bench and so on. The price wasn't great but not terrible either. However, when I checked the Q&A, I once again discovered that there was no one-time ticket and that it had the same typical rules that you'll see in most Japanese gyms, but also that grunting and such were banned because apparently it scares other gym members. However, what really got me was that teaching your friends is not allowed because the gym has its own personal trainers. 
Now, I wanted to go to the gym with a friend who was a complete beginner, and at first, there is quite a lot of coaching that needs to be done, so I decided to avoid that gym as well. But the more I researched, the more I realized that most gyms in Japan all have very similar issues, such as limiting rules, not having a single time pass, being overpriced despite the lack of equipment, and so on. Eventually, I found this one gym that cost around 45 euros a month, despite being too small and crowded for super setting and still missing a cable row and so on, but at least it was open 24-7 and the rules seemed a lot more loose as well, because not only were you allowed to wear outdoor shoes, but filming was allowed as well. You also had mats for deadlifting, and while there were timers you could grab for the 20 minute rule, most people didn't really seem to pay much attention to it, and overall, it had more, more advanced lifters as well. I even saw a Japanese native with quite a lot of exposed tattoos, despite there being a rule against it during registration, which was pretty epic because I thought I finally found a gym that's going to have quite a lot of freedom. However, like I said before, I was teaching a friend who had just started lifting and when you get started, your stabilizer muscles aren't developed yet and he also didn't have the best ankle mobility, making his heels prone to rising during the squat, so sometimes at the end of the set when he had no strength left, his balance would also break and he would fail a rep at the complete bottom and then drop the weight onto the safety rails totally fine. This happened on two sets that had a 15 minute interval and on the second occasion I was approached by a Japanese gym bro who decided to confront me in a very stern and serious manner over my Japanese friend who he didn't even look at failing a squat rep onto the safety rails. He insisted that it was dangerous, makes noise and scares other gym members as well as that there were also women at the gym. I responded pretty agreeably and mentioned that it's almost his first time squatting so he doesn't have the best balance yet, after which he once again insisted that since I obviously know how to squat, I should teach my friend how to stop doing that. Now, unlike him who had multiple friends in the gym, I was a foreigner and an outsider with no authority, so I decided to just be agreeable and did what I could to improve the situation, such as increase the safety rails a bit more and so on, and I also started spotting very diligently by grabbing the bar before it even hit the rails, which honestly felt even more dangerous and that's also a part of what I have a problem with. I personally think that there is nothing inherently unsafe about fading a squat onto the safeties. If anything, I think it's an incredibly good thing for a beginner to get used to and practice fading a squat when the weight is still relatively light, instead of it never happening, which may lead to a phobia of fading a squat rep, which can be even more dangerous if it leads to panicking. This phobia can also result in the trainee being too scared to push themselves close to failure, and they also might end up cutting depth to prevent it from happening. In fact, I saw quite a lot of people perform squats in the same gym, and almost all of them loaded up a ton of weight and then proceeded to squat to not even close to parallel, which is perhaps why there was such a reaction upon seeing someone actually failing a rep and using the safety bars. Now, granted, the drop wasn't perfectly controlled, nor completely silent. I mean, what do you expect from someone squatting for almost the first time? but it literally made less noise than a single deadlift as there was barely any weight on the bar. And overall, I'm used to seeing Rauno Heinla, who stuck tape to deadlift 10 plates while screaming at the top of his lungs at a completely casual local gym that I used to go to, so if a beginner failing a squat rep with light weight onto the safety rails causes a confrontation via proxy because apparently it's dangerous, makes noise and scares people, even though nobody else actually seemed to care, it really felt vexing considering that it didn't even come from the gym staff, but instead from a slightly more advanced than average gym goer who was obviously a regular there. It really reminded me of these two videos by Natural Hypertrophy that I leave in the description about his experience with his local gyms and how other people can start becoming detrimental to your progress, both in terms of practicality and the environment being the opposite of stimulating. I never really had these problems in the public gyms I went to in Estonia, but eventually I still built my own home gym first and foremost to save time, and after thinking about it for a while, I decided that that's exactly what I'm also going to be doing here in Japan.
Now, even though I'm only staying for up to a year, if I split the cost, a decently equipped home gym is going to be cheaper than 10 months of membership and the amount of time I'll save is absolutely invaluable as currently, time-wise, I can only afford to go to the gym 3 times a week, each of which takes an incredibly long amount of time considering I can't even properly superset, so I can save both time and money as well as potentially make even better gains by getting a home gym instead. In fact, I actually already did quite a bit of research and ordered all the equipment that I'm most likely also going to be reviewing, so definitely stay tuned for that. Well anyway, those were my experiences with my local Japanese gyms thus far, and I know I'm not alone in this because if you just google Japanese gyms, it seems that almost everyone has had a similar experience to some extent or another. There definitely are better and more hardcore gyms in Japan as well, if you manage to find them, but building a home gym, even if it's minimal, is definitely an option, but if it isn't, calisthenics is always a choice as well. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, I decided that I'm going to start slowly posting a small amount of bonus content onto Patreon, such as extra thoughts and information on videos such as this one after I upload them, as well as some other small teasers or updates here and there. And finally, just to clarify, all the registrations, forms, interactions and so on that I mentioned in this video happened in Japanese, so I have a lot of thoughts to share on how much Japanese I needed during my first month in Japan, which I'll most likely be making a video about soon, so I'll see you there.